edition of School of Tomorrow events, Guardians of the Future, Shaping Tomorrow with Generative AI. The non-profit School of Tomorrow event series was launched by Beacon House in year 2000 to engage global communities in conversations that shape the future of schools and societies. I would like to thank Google for Education and their partner Tech Valley, the lead sponsor for School of Tomorrow 2023, and our titanium sponsor, United Bank Limited. Other key sponsors include My Backpack, MK Books International, Allied Bank Limited, Franklin Covey, Habib Bank Limited, Wathin, and Interwood. We also thank our School of Tomorrow supporters, including Paramount Books, Nestle Pure Life, who have contributed to this year's event. My name is Mohammed Qasim, and I am an IGCSC and A-Levels Mathematics teacher at Beacon House, Potoha Campus, Islamabad. Please take a moment to note these important housekeeping points. Please ensure your cell phones are on silent. In case of an emergency, the exit point is located at the back of this hall. You may use the staircase opposite to this hall in case if it is blocked or packed, you may use the one on the right hand side. Always stay calm and follow directions. Please use the SOT app to scan the QR code for session question answer and feedback. Share your thoughts on social media using the hashtags, hashtag guardians of the future and hashtag SOT2023. If you need assistance, our ushers are here to help. For questions, please either use the flashcards provided by the ushers or the mobile app. The panel discussion will last for 45 minutes, followed by 15 minutes for question and answers. Now I would like to invite the moderator of the session, Ms. Kawal Malik, on the stage and introduce the panelists. Ms. Kowal is the Deputy General Manager Education Operations at Beacon House. With over 15 years of education experience, she has held many leadership roles at the leading project-based learning school, TNS Beacon House. She's a Cambridge program leader for educational leadership. Ms. Kowal Malik. Assalamu alaikum, good evening everyone. I hope everyone's feeling refreshed at the end of the three a day conference. I would like for you to give us a round of applause as the last session. I think we deserve that. Thank you. Also, we need to make sure that you're all awake and not asleep by now. Anyway, let's begin. Uh, welcome to the 16th edition of SOT events, Guardians of the Future, Shaping Tomorrow with Generative AI. As the moderator of today's panel discussion, I'm delighted to welcome you all. Um, as you can see, this panel, you can see the profiles. We have wonderful people, knowledgeable and experts in their fields who will be talking to us about ownership um, in the age of uh, AI. I'm going to introduce them to you so we know um, who they are. Um, our first panelist is Mr. Andrew Coombe. He is the Managing Director of Oxford AQA. His expertise and experience include leading global teams at Cambridge Assessment International in the Middle East, South Asia, East Asia, and Europe. He is an alumnus of Oxford and Cambridge Universities. Let's welcome Mr. Andrew Coombe. <laughs> then with him, we have Mr. Vaseem Ajmal Chaudhary. Mr. Vaseem Ajmal Chaudhary is the Federal Secretary of Education and Professional Training. With over 25 years in civil service, he also served as CEO of Saaf Pani Company. He was also the National Project Director of a 200 million USD World Bank Initiative for COVID-19 Education Response. Let's welcome Mr. Vaseem Ajmal Chaudhary. <laughs> Next to Mr. Chaudhary, we have Mr. Monis Rahman. Monis Rahman is currently the CEO at Dukan, spearheading the development of a digital commerce ecosystem of MSME. He is also the force behind three venture-backed startups, including Pakistan's largest employment and financial well wellness platform, Rosie, um, and the leading digital lending fintech, Finja. Mr. Monis, welcome to the panel. We are also joined by an online panelist, Dr. Matthew Glanville. Dr. Matthew Glanville is the Director of Assessment at the International Baccalaureate since June 2023, following years of dedicated service within the IB's assessment team. His professional journey includes various roles in the UK, such as QCDA and Ofcall, 
Starting as a mathematics teacher, Dr. Glanwin led, uh, later led research teams in regional and vocational skills agency. Welcome, Dr. Glanville. And last but not the least, I'm sure most of you already know our uh, AI avatar panelist, Nadia. Uh, Nadia, ladies and gentlemen, is our digital panelist. Uh, for the first time in Pakistan, SOT Events presents AI avatars who will participate in this discussion. Nadia always tells us that she will not give any opinions because her responses are going to be factual and text-based. So let's see how she responds to us today. Let's welcome Nadia. And let me just test her out whether she is awake and not fallen asleep. Uh, Nadia, can you introduce yourself? <laughs> That's okay. I think we're going to give her some time to uh, see how um, she would like to respond or not. We'll come back to you, Nadia. Um, so Hello, uh, Nadia. Oh. It's a pleasure to have another Nadia joining the conversation. Yes, I am here with you. How can I assist you today? Is there something specific you would like to discuss or ask about? Uh, can you introduce yourself, Nadia? Okay, she doesn't of like Of course, it. Nadia. As an AI avatar panelist for School of Tomorrow events, I'm here to engage in conversations, answer questions, and provide insights on various topics. I'm designed to assist and interact with users like you. How can I help you today? So Nadia, if you could respond to all our questions in the, um, in the, next, in the panel, I think that would be wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for your introduction. Now let's move on to our panel discussion today. Um, we all know um, that in today's world of generative AI, um, the way we think about who owns and gets credit for content is changing. Um, a lot of people are uh, taking support from uh, different AI-supported platforms like ChatGPT, BARD, um, and the question remains who owns the content when we take support from these platforms. Now, on the screen you can see um, we have a human headmaster of Cotsmer um, High School, and then we have next to him Mr. Miss Abigail Bailey, who is the AI head teacher uh, recently appointed by the school. And the human uh, headmaster, Tom Rogerson, said that he's using the robot to give him advice on issues ranging from how to support fellow staff members in helping students with ADHD, and most importantly, writing school policies. So the question remains, when Abigail writes the school policies, um, who will have the ownership? And of course, we'll delve deeper. Now, I would request my esteemed panelists to let's start with an opening statement. Um, about our topic of discussion that is navigating originality and ownership in generative AI. Mr. Andrew Coombe, in your experience, in extensive experience in the field of education and assessment, if you could give us your thoughts in, in, in an opening statement about how do we navigate originality and ownership in generative AI. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Can you hear me, everyone? Yeah. Um, I guess I would start by just reflecting on what AI is and what it can um, help to do us, to do for us. And uh, a colleague of mine at Oxford um, just says, well, AI is just maths. It's just maths. It's just a tool. And if you think of it as a tool, it's a tool that will be very helpful, that can do things, m many more things than we've been able to do um, uh, as humans. It can do them much faster and it can probably do them much more cost-effectively. So it's capable of doing a lot more administrative tasks. But if you think about the outputs, if you take an uncritical view, if you just take what uh, an AI tool produces for you, then I don't think you can claim any ownership of that. But I don't think that's what's happening in most cases, because what you tend to find is that AI is a tool. It helps you. It can perhaps create a first draft, it can help come up with prompts, it can help with your inspiration and creativity perhaps. It, it can inspire that. But I think you need to, I think we all need to view it as just that, as something to start with, 
that we can then build on and we can create our own originality using inputs from that tool. And if you think about it, if you think about, um, I don't know, artists or musicians, they have always in the past been influenced by other things that they have seen around them, by music that's gone before from different composers. And just because they've used those things as inspiration, it doesn't mean that their outputs are not their own. And, and I think AI is, is the same. If, it, if it's used as a tool to inspire and as a starting point, um, then I think people can use it and still claim ownership. That's, that's a view. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And I completely agree with you. We do keep inspiration from the content that is already around us. And I think that is what AI does, uses the database that is being input by humans most of the time. Great. Thank you so much. Now, coming to you, Mr. Vaseem Ajmal Chaudhary, you are the Federal Secretary of Education. Um, in your current role, how do you see AI changing or impacting originality and ownership, um, especially in our context in Pakistan? Thank you very much, Kamal. And uh, indeed, it's been a pleasure coming here and meeting uh, professionals and uh, other stakeholders. Uh, AI uh, domain, uh, has really, you know, posed uh, very severe, serious challenges in the domain of uh, policy making and in the way education uh, as a whole is being imparted uh, to the uh, children. Uh, because it's not, the, the purpose of education is not only to, you know, give certifications or degrees to the boys and girls and they come out and, and perform certain, you know, defined roles in economy and certain money. We all know that society, in a society, for a, a, a child to become a responsible citizen in order to promote uh, peace, harmony, tolerance, and, uh, you know, having a kind of uh, inclination for democratic and human values, all these things are important uh, if, if at all, even if, you know, we uh, don't consider other things like sports or community work, etc. So keeping all that in mind, uh, AI, which can facilitate a lot uh, to the school management as well as uh, other uh, important areas um, uh, to the policy managers as well as to school managers. But then there are this entire, uh, you know, ecosystem has to be seen in the context whether it really enables the learners or whether it really enables the children to become more responsible, more uh, uh, kind of tolerant, and uh, more pluralistic approach in his uh, approach towards life. Because we all know that uh, using AI tools, whereby uh, they uh, might have, you know, that kind of data or algorithms uh, inbuilt into that, uh, which could be, uh, have many, could be having many kinds of biases. You know, after all, all these would be developed not by the developing world or countries like us. These tools will be developed by, you know, someone from the West, someone from, you know, uh, the, the developed world which we call. And their biases could obviously, you know, influence our kids. Uh, we are already, you know, that doesn't mean that we need to uh, be, you know, afraid of that. But the only thing is, that how cognizant we are, how do we actually manage those kinds of things. I was recently, you know, uh, seeing that uh, debate about uh, one of the AI tool where by, and, and when, uh, you know, it was asked that uh, whether Israelis have uh, the kind of, you know, citizens' rights and what kind of Palestinians, uh, uh, you know, uh, rights they have. So the answer was very clear in terms of biases. So that is just one area. Uh, whereby we have to be, you know, uh, very careful. Uh, and similarly, you know, it's all, not only about AI, but uh, in fact, towards all other kinds of uh, ad tech interventions, whereby we have to see whether they really support uh, uh, the overall objectives of education, particularly in a country like us, and also whether uh, they really support the children and the school management, including teachers, to enhance learning objectives. So, sir, no, thank you so much for your response, and I do agree with you that in our context, of course, in the public sector, just having that awareness that the kind of impact AI could have 
in terms of how students produce their work would be the first step for us. Because in our public sector, of course, we are not actually there. I know you have been um, part of many initiatives in terms of bringing in a lot of technology in the public sector during COVID. But uh, even with uh, people like you, with your vision, uh, we still have a long way to go. So I do agree that having that understanding as a first step is extremely important and having that understanding of the certain challenges that are posed. Uh, so thank you so much. Now, Mon is coming to you. I know your role is very different from what the, the, uh, the, uh, than the rest of the gentlemen here. They are purely educationist and that sector, you are a digital entrepreneur um, and people and students come to you with ideas all the time. Um, how do you see AI impacting ideas when it comes to entrepreneurship? Uh, so I think first, important for all of us to understand, you know, AI has been around for a very long time. AI is not new. I think what is new and this uh, sort of um, uh, interest in AI that has uh, skyrocketed has come over the last year when ChatGPT launched commercially. It's been about a year. It's not a lot of time, but already it's transformed the way we're doing things and the power of AI we're seeing has been exponentially more powerful month on month. What AI couldn't do a month ago, it can do today, and what AI can't do today, it can do tomorrow because of the way the model learns. And I want to talk about that a little bit prior to going into your question because it's important to understand that you know this, this uh, GPT, this uh, generative AI wave that's come, what it's doing is it is basically indexing uh, the universe of information that's already available out there. There's lots of data out there on Google and websites and uh, you know, inside databases. And what it does is it takes all of that information, it memorizes it, and creates a mathematical model that predicts based on what you type. And it doesn't even know what it's going to say because every time it makes a prediction, it jumps to make another prediction and another prediction. So it's a statistical generated content, which ends up making a lot of sense because the algorithm is very powerful. And the reason I'm saying this is because it's important to understand that if somebody takes content that was generated by ChatGPT, they aren't violating a copyright of ChatGPT because ChatGPT doesn't own that content. In fact, ChatGPT won't be able to even tell you where it got the content from, and it's certainly from more than one place. So when people take content from these AI engines, and reproduce them, they're not really stealing anybody's copyright, it's you know, created. I think the problem is when they take credit for it on their own and they didn't do it. And I think this is going to be a moot point going forward because it's all very new. We're struggling with how to deal with it. But what it points to is that the skills of today and tomorrow are changing dramatically. We used to really emphasize the importance of handwriting for young kids, make sure it's very neat in the lines. Kids would win competitions for handwriting. But now we know that if my child has the best handwriting in the world, uh, the correlation to that and future success is not very strong. And likewise, the ability to put things together which are now readily available through AI models, and increasingly so, are probably not the skills that we want to emphasize for our kids. Coming back to how this impacts the startup landscape, it's actually very revolutionary. Now, there's a recent paper that was produced by Google saying that AI cannot give anything novel. It simply takes information it has and regurgitates it and gives it in various forms. Mm. But the ability to reason based on that information and create new novel ideas is not yet there as a part of AI. So entrepreneurs you know, can't use AI to invent something that's never been invented before and say, wow. It's more enhancement of you know, how productive they are. But um, one thing that's very important to note is that because our ecosystem lacks certain skills due to the education crisis we have in our country, AI ends up being a great equalizer. Yes. So if you have entrepreneurs from uh, you know, a remote area of the country whose English skills aren't that strong, who can't communicate that well, mm. all of a sudden AI has given them an edge. Yes. Uh, there are uh, software programmers who are using AIs to code. There are individuals who are building user interfaces by using AI to translate websites and explain it to them in Roman Urdu. And this is what's phenomenal, is now AI has learned Roman Urdu. It's learned it. Nobody sat there and tried to teach it Urdu. It just ate up all the information and it learned. It's magical, right? So now imagine on WhatsApp, which your driver, your cook, and a rickshaw driver have, being able to automate and giving digital services powered by AI in Roman Urdu. This is a game changer. 
this allows you to access a whole group of people that were excluded. So I think it's a great advantage. And the last thing I'll just wanna say, you know, uh, is the Biden administration recently passed this executive order. This just happened, executive order. It means it didn't go through Congress and have a vote and sign into law. The president said, here's an executive order, here's how it is. And it was sent to most of the tech platforms. And what this executive order said is if you are a tech platform building AI and you are using more than 10 billion parameters, and parameters is the amount of information you're feeding the AI with. If you have 10 billion parameters, it's a large scale model which can get dangerous in the eyes of the administration. You have to be licensed. You have to report what you're doing and you have to be audited. And it also said that AI companies should embed a digital fingerprint, a footprint, so that you can detect what's going on. Because, make no mistake, because of the random nature of AI, it is indistinguishable. And anybody saying, well, you can put a filter and understand which one's AI, it's random every time. You can tell AI to speak to you in Shakespearean language. So it's not practical to uh, restrict the output of AI and say that I'll be able to tell it's AI. You will if you're the teacher. Great, great. I, yes, so I think this is something that Andrew also <laughs> mentioned, that taking inspiration of, from something that is already available, and this is what um, I think chat GPT getting information that is already available and then not perhaps producing as intelligent work as humans do. I think this is safe to say that. Anyway, Dr. Glenville, thank you so much. Can you hear us, Dr. Glenville? I can hear you perfectly. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. <coughs> so uh, coming to your opening statement, Dr. Glanville, what are your views? And of course, because you're associated with International Baccalaureate, um, what are your views on um, how do we navigate originality and ownership um, in this time of generative AI? So I, I think I want to start off by saying what a great example the head teacher you cited has put for their students. Because what I think from the IB perspective is artificial intelligence is going to be here. We're going to need to show our students how to navigate it and what ethical use of AI looks like. And that head teacher by saying, look, I've appointed somebody, I'm using this, and this is how I'm using it, is a great role model for their students of what ethical use looks like. But also to answer your question, if there's an issue with any of the policies that that school has, the, the book will still stop with that head teacher. So whilst it's a tool for supporting uh, the creation of policies, it's not replacing the head teacher there. Within the IB, what we're really trying to do is be, get students to be transparent when they've used AI. Not stop its use, but for them to be clear of when it's been there, how it's been used. So within the assessment space, we're asking them to be clear and reference, this came from ChatGBT, Bard, whatever else. But also, we're asking our teachers to work with the students because whilst using ChatGPT and other artificial intelligence to support thinking is a great thing and something we should encourage, what we can't allow it to do is to replace, te uh, replace thinking. So a student who uses it to gather ideas, uses it to help refine their essay, uses it to help structure their argument, that's a great ethical use. But the student who just submits something that they got ChatGPT to write last night isn't actually using it ethically. And the teacher will know that. As teachers, you can tell when a student has got somebody else to do their homework for them. And in many ways, this is just an extension of that previous practice of getting somebody else to do the work for them. And they can't do that follow-up. They can't do that explanation of why they came to that conclusion. So that's really at the heart of how we are approaching this encouraging students to use it in an ethical way, exploring with teachers what ethical looks like, what are the new skills that artificial intelligence brings to the community, and also then those challenging questions of when is it copyright infringement, when is it not, how do we reference things properly in the AI world, and also issues like where does imitation come from? If you're imitating somebody, is that the same as copying somebody. So there's a lot of really exciting opportunities here. The biggest opportunity for everybody though is, as one of my fellow panelists said, removing barriers. As a young man, I really know that the difference it made when I was allowed to use a calculator to do maths, 
suddenly remove that barrier of me being very poor at arithmetic and actually allow me to go on and study a PhD in mathematics. I think the same opportunity is here. It's going to let students who struggle to communicate, whether it is in any particular language or is it between languages, to show the ideas they've got and then it is their ideas being communicated. That's got to be a good thing. But in the assessment space, how do we reward that? How do we balance between being able to make a coherent argument that perhaps ChatGPT can help with and how we get those ideas that were behind that argument, which is what we really should value in the student. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Glanville. And I could see there was a teacher, mathematics teacher, talking about how if you know your students, you would exactly know whether their produced work is by Chad GPT or they, their own ideas because, of course, you know the text and you know. So I'm going to spin that question back at you, Mr. Andrew, in terms of um, Oxford, uh, knowing that these, uh, there is uh, a potential with AI uh, of students com using that for their assignments, even potentially for their assessment prep. Um, what is Oxford uh, thinking? What, is there any policy that you feel is going to be in place in the future to combat that? Because IB has a slightly different structure. Uh, it is a combination of summative and formative. However, with, with Oxford, of course, it's the end of year um, exam. So the examiner, when they're looking at the answer sheet, they are not familiar with the student. So how would they know whether or not it is the original work? Is there anything that Oxford is thinking about? Well, I think it, um, it highlights the, um, the difference and the, and the importance to some extent of summative and formative tools and how they need to be treated uh, differently. Um, uh, most of our assessments are summative, but, but you're right, not all. And uh, we do have project-based qualifications as well, which are extremely popular. Um, I think it's a challenge. I think um, you can, uh, I, I certainly agree um, with Matthew that we have to make sure that where AI is used it needs to be acknowledged. Um, that's very important. Um, there are also lots of tools that um, AI can help us actually to detect when there is malpractice going on, which we use. Um, but I think it's also a challenge for us that may lead to us thinking in a different way in the future, and I'm certainly not saying this is about to happen, but uh, we all know, and I think you know, we've seen it um, today with the experience when you speak to, when you speak to AI, um, it doesn't necessarily respond exactly as you might want it to. And it's easy to tell straight away um, whether, when you talk to someone, whether they uh, know what they're talking about or not. So there is discussion going on about whether oral exams, which are still used um, quite widely in some parts of the world, might be a good way of bringing back that kind of assessment. From a, from a sort of a, 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 an assessment organisation, that's not necessarily the easiest thing to do because it can be very um, labour intensive, very difficult to implement. But it's certainly true that in a very short space of time, if you have a doubt about whether a student has created a piece of work, if you ask them a question about it, you will know almost immediately, just as a teacher will, um, whether or not they know what they're talking about, and, and you can, that will be a, um, a hint as to whether they produced it or not. So um, I kind of agree with, uh, with what's been said before. We should definitely um, embrace AI. Um, we should encourage students to use it, but to use it ethically in the right way and acknowledge when they're doing so. And, um, and I think that's, uh, that's the way we will, we will all learn and we will all improve as we go. Yes, I do agree, yes. And I, I think that would be great if we could incorporate the oral exam or assessment because, again, you can really cross-check whether it's students' own thinking, their work. Um, excellent. So, sir, coming to you, uh, Mr. Vaseem um, Ajmal Chaudhary. Uh, in terms of policy, we talked about Oxford thinking about certain policies. Do you think or do you have any plan of action uh, in, for the public sector in the assessment system where AI could play a role. I know we are, we are uh, sort of further away from uh, the detection part. At the moment, we are only at the stage where students 
whether or not they will have access to AI. But do you think the government is thinking of a policy where, one, there is going to be access for our students to have, to use at least generative AI, uh, or then later on any academic um, honesty or something on the lines of that? Uh, so far, what we have started uh, looking into this aspect is that start using this tool uh, for the federal board officials themselves. Uh, the chairman of the federal board is sitting here. We have engaged an AI firm that how do we actually translate this uh, subjective way of uh, marking the question papers into a kind of objectively evaluated uh, with the help of an AI tool. So that work has already started and we would be using uh, that kind of uh, technology support very soon. So as far as the students are concerned that how do we encourage students? So far, you know, uh, as I had already discussed that uh, for me, the adoption of technology uh, in the public sector is a kind of, you know, uh, uh, a mechanism whereby we see it in terms of costs. For example, the uh, private schools or their students can be uh, wealthy or can have resources to adopt those kinds of tools very early on. But for the public sector uh, who come from, uh, you know, kind of uh, socioeconomic background with, and also the public schools who don't have these kinds of infrastructure, so for them, it's a cost-intensive thing. So I was very intrigued to listen when uh, um, Monis. Uh, Monis said that for entrepreneurship, yes. it has become a kind of cost-effective. But as far as you know, delivery of education systems is concerned, for us, technology is quite you know has actually increased the digit you know the inequities, what we call the digital divide. Mm. So the wealthy and the influential families and school systems can adopt it early on. So for us, it's a challenge in terms of, uh, you know, for the kids. And also, because for the public, assuming the responsibility of a kid, just like the parents have uh, quite uh, that kind of responsibility for their kids in home, exposing them to a situation which might not be uh, their age appropriate uh, kind of uh, intervention, or, you know, when I think of, you know, something which is not uh, owned by anyone, you know, uh, the kind of, you know, just think of a textbook, uh, you know, which is not written by anyone. Uh, it's just produced by maybe uh, a kind of AI-aided uh, uh, support. So whom do we, you know, uh, hold accountable for that? Yes. So it's uh, really a question that at this stage, I think uh, the governments are trying to uh, see uh, as a whole and get data uh, that what is going on in this field and how careful we should be to adopt these kinds of uh, strategies. For example, in terms of UNESCO, which is a kind of uh, a policy forum for the governments, they have produced certain reports and advised the governments to uh, how do they actually embrace it, but as well as caution it in terms of uh, 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 you know coming up with some kind of policy regulations first and then only allow it uh, for the kids to start using it great so i mean i mean i'm glad and i'm sure the audience and everyone else is that there is a lot of discussion already happening a lot of data being collected um, just uh, on a on a personal note sir have you ever used chat gpt to produce something <laughs> <laughs> yeah i've been using it for you know uh, just matthew said that uh, uh, oral as well as, you know, uh, exams. So we often use it when we evaluate a CV and then we call okay. him for the interview and see what is the characteristics which he have, you know, written for himself that in terms of experience, in terms of attributes of qualifications, but once you actually, you know, interview him, it comes out a different person. So is the case, you know, in many cases whereby, you know, uh, this chat GPT, you know, uh, started. So we started asking him many questions. Uh, they are sometimes interesting, but yes. sometimes, you know, not relevant uh, for most of our decisions. So I think why I asked is when we all use it, I use it a lot. But when you use it consistently, you sort of get to know a pattern, how the kind of text it produces, and you sort of see that pattern, and then you are able to differentiate between human 
produced text and AI uh, produced text. So, uh, Monas, I'll sort of throw the same question at you. Have you used and Chat GPT Bard, and for what purposes? If you yeah, um, I I use Chat GPT. I use Open AI's APIs. I'm a software guy, so we program. We don't type manually. We have our programs use AI and do magical things. And we've managed to do amazing things with it. And one of the things that we'll be launching soon will be interesting for you. You basically upload CVs, and it's going to read through there and get all the skills out, create a dynamic assessment test based on your job description. Mm -hmm. These are programs talking to AI. And we're launching this next week. But it's very easy to do. So a few things I want to say. One is that this whole AI has become very, very accessible. AI used to be very expensive. You had to hire PhDs to do ML and you know, all these sort of models and a team of six, eight people spend one year of work and the results weren't that good. Now, my 15-year-old son, who's, who's a Python programmer, he's learned very quickly, any child can learn it, uh, and he's writing APIs to do these, these things. And now it speaks Urdu, so you can talk to it in Urdu. So I think actually it's, it's going to be a revolution for the have-nots. I think AI can be a revolution for the have-nots. And statistically, we've seen that rich parents, their children perform in a better way on statistical exams. I mean, there's lots of you know, numbers around this. But if you're rich, your child has a higher chance of doing well as compared to a poor child. Mm -hmm. And I think with the advent of AI and how easily accessible it is, any of you could connect to AI in a matter of half an hour. And you don't need software programmers. And it's become more accessible. Uh, the thing that I think is important to say is, you know. In the startup world, we say, don't run to where the ball is. Run to where the ball is going. Mm -hmm. And AI is evolving so quickly. Yeah. These models are going from you know, 5 billion parameters to 10 billion to 100 billion to trillions of parameters. Compute power that's needed, the, soft, the, the hardware chips that allow it to crunch this information is growing equally fast. And so right now, to create policies based on what we're seeing with AI, is actually futile because things are moving so fast that the mm -hmm. moment you create some structure on, well, we should be doing this and this with AI, next two, three months, things are going to change again. So why not run to where the ball is going to go? And you know, there are great educators in this room. And this is a historical inflection point. Things are changing quickly. Mm -hmm. There used to be a time where you were not allowed to take a calculator into an exam. right? And now you can. And because the concept behind that is what you really need to know. And I think in the same way, teaching, you know, the ability to grade an essay based on the vocabulary used, mm. the spelling mistakes, the grammar, all of these skills, I think they're going to be commoditized. And the assumption should be that everybody is going to use AI or chat GPT, not, you know, did you use it or not. I think we have to preempt that and assume yeah. it's going to be used. So how do I test this person? What are the essential skills of tomorrow? And I think this is, this is something we have to think about. And the answer isn't available today because AI is changing so quickly. Yes. But I think AI has a tremendous impact on your curriculums that need to be quickly revamped. And we don't really know. But it's essential to do that because maybe many of the skills that we're teaching are not skills that will be important in the future. And we're penalizing our students to conform to the past. Yes. No, no, I do agree. It is changing. And I would like to now try out if Nadia is still awake and with us um, and ask her. Um, there is a sort of a request from the audience if I could ask Nadia a question. And then Dr. Glanville, I'll, of course, come, come back to you. Uh, let's give it a try. If a student uses artificial intelligence to finish his homework, who will be the owner of that homework? Nadia, please don't disappoint us. So as you can see, generative AI takes longer to process information and looks through the database. And our human panelists, of course, were very prompt with their idea. So I think we need a round of applause for that. So Nadia doesn't want to talk to us. Um, that is fine. So uh, Dr. Glanville, coming back to you, we did talk about excess uh, with, in the Pakistani context. Um, with IB and um, you know, generally, globally as well, 
I'm not sure if everyone has access to generative AI. Not a lot of parents uh, would like their children to use it. Um, how do you bring that equity in terms of our assessment system uh, for students who do not have access to AI to produce better work or refine their work, if I would sort of put it that way, and those who don't? Or do you think it's even relevant or important in this day and age? It is definitely important. The student will uh, still be the owner of the homework, as they are the one who used AI as a tool to assist them. Oh, thank you, Nadia. You were late, but at least, uh, but, and, but I mean, that's not very nice to interrupt Dr. Glenville, but thank you for your <laughs> response. Um, there you go, Matthew. I'm going to, let's please hear it from you. Cool. Um, as I said, yes, inequality is really important, um, and we need to understand what the different um, elements of that inequality are. As previous speakers said, that sort of social inequality is known to have a big effect. And I, I personally wonder how much the digital is a subset, or inequality is a subset of that, and how, which is the one we need to address first. In order to address the, the key question you ask is how do we stop students being disadvantaged? Um, it's really about valuing what the student does, not what the AI does. So if you're going to give lots of marks for uh, beautifully written or correct spelling or correct grammar or any of that sort of area which AI and indeed lots of existing tools can help with already then that's going to create that disadvantage if you're going to focus on some of the higher order thinking skills mm. the way in which the student has developed the thinking then you're not giving that same level of ability for students to get marks for what the artificial intelligence has done for them. So we really need to focus on letting the student show what they've done, letting the student think about things and bringing it to the level beyond what the AI is doing. Having said that, there's a real challenge for us about how over the next three to four months, three to four years, artificial intelligence is going to develop and whether it's going to get better at making those links and what does that mean for the student who aren't yet at the level of being able to do that bringing together of arguments how are we going to make sure that certain students aren't left behind because the skill sets that they've practiced in the past are the ones that artificial intelligence can do for them in the future and again, I think that's really about inquiry-based education. It's about having the student lead how they think about stuff. With the introduction of the internet and Google and Wikipedia, there was this fear that suddenly facts could be easily grabbed off the internet. And in today's world, we've more or less accepted that if you want to know a fact, you Google it. You then need the skill set to understand whether you've got a reliable source that information or not because some sites on the website are pretty reliable others are very very biased which is of course why artificial intelligence has bias built into it and these are the skills that we need our students to have that critical thinking skill and it goes beyond just the ai world it goes into all the other arenas where students think about what's said to them critically and draw their own conclusions about it based on what they value and what they don't value as opposed to just accepting the information so really it's about as previously said looking ahead what are the skills we need for the future mm -hmm. and then how do we embed those in the classroom now and we, we we've seen that gradual change over the past 10 20 30 years with the introduction of more access to knowledge more access to what's available on the internet and that digital divide there but we can still we still need to do more because the, the next level is happening with artists it's making it even easier to produce work that in the past had to be a copy and paste job from students who then had to craft it together whereas now the technology will make it look as good as um, a human produced essay a human produced piece of work I would also just like to say 
you said earlier that you can tell the kind of style. I think that A, AI will get better at avoiding that, mm. and B, students will become very, very good at avoiding that kind of language. So it's not easy just to look and say, yeah, well, that was mm. produced by artificial intelligence. But what they won't be able to do is understand it if they haven't engaged with it properly and don't have the understanding behind it when you question them. So that, that sort of interactive assessment, where you ask a follow-up question, whether that's oral, digital, or whatever may other means, is really the way forward. Great, great. No, I mean, that is, of course, helpful. And like, like you said, AI is improving uh, very rapidly. Uh, so I know in the audience we have more parents and teachers than students. I was going to ask you guys to for a piece of advice um, for keeping originality and ownership, but do we have any advice for our audience who are mainly parents or teachers? Because AI is here to stay. Uh, students will use it for their assessments, for their homework. It will impact um, original work. It will impact um, ownership. So is there any advice, last piece of advice from all of you, one by one, for the audience um, from you with your experience and expertise in the educational field? Andrew, let's start from you. Um, okay, two pieces of advice I would say. First is um, don't try to ban things. Don't try to stop students from using things. Encourage them, um, but encourage them to do it in the right way. And the second thing I would say as teachers and parents is ask your students lots of questions uh, because that's the way you will check um, whether they're learning and whether they know about things and, and ask and encourage them to ask questions as well and never take things at face value always think about um, is this true where does it come from how do I know uh, so ask questions great no thank you so much that's extremely helpful so more human interaction to counter AI, I would say. I think that's what I get from your response. Yes, sir, any advice uh, for the audience from you? Of course, aapka, your context is more local, so it would be valuable yeah. for us. Of course, uh, it's more or less uh, same advice. Uh, we all uh, want to make sure that our kids learn 21st century skills, including all kinds of digital skills. But simultaneously, uh, we want to actually reduce their uh, time uh, of screen, you know, and that is where what is very important that in the context of AI, it has to be seen whether the process of knowledge creation uh, should not be somehow, uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, devoid of the human interaction. So that is an area uh, which, where uh, the parents, the teachers have to uh, be cognizant of the fact that their learner, the child, doesn't get its his entire worldview from uh, AI or algorithms or you know a kind of uh, data sets uh, which are quite you know uh, detached from reality sometimes and particularly in our societies where all these technology sets uh, or the data might have a lot of biases might have a lot of uh, you know uh, influence in in a manner that the kids can actually go astray, defeating the overall purpose of the society and the education system. Great. So again, thank you so much. That is wonderful exercise, uh, uh, advice, sorry. Uh, Monis, the same question with a twist. Because your work with digital entrepreneurs, anything for them, specifically because uh, why I ask for that advice, because there is a lot of investment involved with entrepreneurship. So we really need to see where to put that money, which is extremely important as well. So in, in, in light of that, what would be your uh, advice for us and for students, the new generation? The, um, first of all, you know, uh, I again want to use the analogy of the calculator. And I want to talk about children and then as they grow up, because I think it varies by age group. It's not a broad brush stroke. You definitely need children to develop these foundational skills, being able to add and to multiply and learn the tables and all of that. But then after a certain age, you're like, okay, now they can start to use calculators. Mm -hmm. And I think that age has come down. And what we find is our children actually end up learning faster when they have these calculators. Example of my son, 
We got him a very nice one, graphical, and he kept entering equations and watching them, and he learned so much by just interactively playing with this tool and technology. It was the right time to give it to him because foundation was strong. If we had been using a calculator since you know grade two, then he would be lacking very important foundational skills. Mm -hmm. AI is the same way. I think you know uh, at the right age, we need to make sure the children learn these foundational skills without the computer. But once they're past that age, we need to encourage them to use these tools because their ability to get proficiency on these tools is going to impact how well they do. There are professions today, a new profession that came out in the last year, called a prompt engineer. There are people paid money to write prompts for AI engines to get the right things back. This is a new skill. So these skills are going to be very, very important. So you know, again, going back to startups and entrepreneurs, since they have presumably already acquired the foundational skills, um, adding AI layers to everything and anything is creating a disruption. You name the vertical, people now doing the exact same thing that had been done for many years by putting an AI layer, which is actually very easy, surprisingly easy to build, mm -hmm. allows them to disrupt an old player because they've just added a simple AI layer. They're not doing a lot of the work themselves. So um, AI is a big, great equalizer. And I think we'll realize this. AI is seen as a very advanced technology that's not accessible. But the irony is that AI actually is an equalizer. Now, 80% of adults in this country have smartphones. My, uh, I have a cook. His uh, son is about the age of my son. They're not going to the same schools, but he's educating them. My children's English is much better. But it doesn't really matter now, because this child on his smartphone, his dad's smartphone, can use ChatGPT and generate beautiful content. And that is really the test of the human intellect as opposed to this biased background of how well he was able to speak English because we could afford that. Mm. So again, you know, I just want to say it's a great equalizer. It's a great opportunity for Pakistan, especially the bottom of the pyramid, the masses in Pakistan who need it most. It, it makes education accessible to them, especially as we localize these things. So we should embrace it. We should embrace it, certainly, certainly. Using our own intelligence, not let artificial intelligence overtake that, but certainly use it intelli intelligently. So, Dr. Matthew, any last pieces of advice from you? Again, keeping in view the assessment and ori originality and the dangers. <clears throat> um, we know students, young people pick up technology quicker than some of us, so, uh, slightly older gentlemen and ladies. So, really, learn with your students and your children, and indeed learn from your students and your children. And by engaging with them in how it's used, you'll then be able to give them the sort of the ethical framework, which they can then take forward and use the other ways. Um, to go full circle back to where I started this, as parents, as teachers, you are role models for your students. So if they see you using artificial intelligence in certain ways, they will think that that's the right way to use it. So let's make sure that we, A, don't hide from it, we do embrace it, and also we use it in the way that we would like our young people to use it. Great, thank you so much, and I think that is valuable. Now we have uh, just a couple of minutes for uh, questions uh, from the audience. Ms. Hina, can we have the other question that we had earlier? So, uh, so I think specifically, Monas, this is for you. So when you said that we need to see where the ball rolling to, should it not be now critical to test students on how well they can build AI to pave their way to the future jobs? Absolutely. I mean, this is a new sort of competency that we're struggling with. But there's no doubt that being able to navigate AI efficiently is going to be a huge edge. And you know, maybe this is the way to counter this sort of plagiarism problem. It used to be the case that our children would go to the internet and Google something and they would do a cut and paste and we could tell that it's plagiarized and due to the random nature of AI, it's impossible to do it. You can make AI write in any style. I can tell AI to put 20 E's in the answer. That's my footprint, right? Mm -hmm. So. Um, so, it's, so yes, absolutely, we need to be teaching our children to be using this. And uh, I don't think it's, I think it's a necessity. Something that is unavoidable as well. Yes. Something that is unavoidable. Any other questions from the audience? I think we have talked about that already, but 
Um, let's see what are the biggest dangers we face uh, for our students in, with the increasing use of AI. Um, Andrew, you, would you like to take that? And then I'll move to Mr. Chaudhary. Um, yeah, uh, maybe two quick thoughts. Um, one of the biggest dangers, I think, with technology is that rather than enhancing learning, there is a risk that it can replace learning. And that's absolutely what we need to avoid. So I think, you know, Monisi's point about foundational skills um, is really critical. And just one more thing, and, and it's another piece of advice that may sound a bit counterintuitive here, is sometimes just get out and enjoy yourselves without any technology and any screens, because there's a great world out there that, yes, uh, that we can all learn from. Sir, would you agree with that in terms of, I mean, you, you said that earlier that we need to also sort of off-screen time is more important. Um, in terms of, um, let's, I'll, I'll have the uh, next question for you now that we have it. Thank you so much, Ms. Hina. When we say that AI is usually moderated by the Western world, what should be our role as a nation in terms of information input? How can we use it as an advantage for Pakistan? I think that would be a very good last question for you. Uh, not only very good question, rather very difficult question. Difficult as well, yes. <laughs> uh, in fact, uh, you know, this is not a question of uh, whether to use it or not use it. It's not an either or. I tend to agree with all the panelists that uh, this is a necessity. We have to adopt it. And the only thing is that uh, we have to be, you know, conscious of the fact. Uh, when we, I say this, that... Uh, you know, there was a time that knowledge was being transferred from the east towards the west. We all know from India or Andalusia to the west. And if the, now the flow is from, you know, uh, from west to east, there would be issues. For example, even in terms of, you know, copyrights, you know, when we transferred knowledge, we didn't ask for any copyright. Yeah. <laughs> so once now it is coming from uh, west to east, uh, I mean, there are licenses, there are issues of copyrights. Similarly, when we say that it might be costly, because at the moment, uh, uh, you know, AI tools are accessible to everyone, but what if, you know, it starts happening that, okay, you can access to that level, but if you want to go beyond that, then you have to pay for that. So, you know, that kind of issues would obviously create a divide whereby have-nots might uh, be left behind on that. Uh, the role of the government uh, for the Pakistan would be that we would also use the same tool, AI tool, to guard us against, you know, those kinds of biases or those kinds of dangers which could, you know, inflect uh, upon the education systems, overall objectives and purposes uh, for us. So we also have to use the same tools. Uh, there's no way out. Yeah. No, thank you so much. And I think how I would conclude that, and I'm sure Matthew sitting there, um, you would agree with us as well as concluding remarks that I think in the age of AI and what you see on the stage, a very good balance of East and West uh, working together. I think we are beyond that. Uh, there is no such thing as East or West. These are ideas, human. We, are, we live in a global world. Um, and this is what you saw in terms of our panel discussion today. The time is up. Thank you so much uh, to our panelists, our audience, for participating in SOT 16. We would like to thank you. Uh, thanks our sponsor, Google for Education. And thank you so much for all your input. Uh, it was a wonderful, wonderful discussion, and I'm sure the audience is taking a few pieces of advice with them. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Matthew. Thank you.